Who are some of the people who seem to love doing crime? Let's find out. Starting with number six, the scamming couple. Bikini model Patricia Perez Gonzalez and her boyfriend Alberto Campagnoni faced allegations of identity theft, grand larceny, and fraud after they were caught running a $2 million identity theft ring back in 2016. They were accused of stealing the personal information of a bunch of elderly people. Their scam involved opening up 40 American Express Platinum cards in the names of their victims, having them mailed to vacant properties, and then spending as much as they could. For a little over a year, the couple went bananas, charging up to $2 million in fraudulent transactions. Their lavish purchases included luxury vacations to New York, Los Angeles, and Hawaii fine dining at expensive restaurants, and shopping sprees at renowned designer stores like Hermes, Burberry, Louis Vuitton, and Chanel. The couple, who looked rather unassuming in their beige-colored prison garb, sat emotionless during their court proceedings. They were being held on $500,000 bail and pleaded not guilty. However, despite the amount of damage she caused, Patricia Perez Gonzalez received a pretty light sentence. As part of a plea deal, she copped to one count of fourth degree grand larceny and managed to avoid any jail time. The dental hygiene student known for flaunting her extravagant lifestyle on social media left Manhattan Supreme Court with a smile on her face. Her defense lawyer, probably noticing how bad that looks, tried to point out her positive transformation emphasizing her commitment to being a full-time college student achieving high grades. Alberto Compagnoni, who took a deal too, didn't do as well. He pleaded guilty to grand larceny and identity theft and was sentenced to serve two to six years in prison. So what do you think? Was it fair that Alberto got sentenced like he did while his girl was basically told that what she did wasn't nice and she needed to stop? Tell us in the comments below. Number five, the real estate guru. Mickey Lynn Fox, a Houston-based social media influencer, was sentenced to five years in prison for orchestrating a real estate scam that targeted unsuspecting investors. The 41-year-old, known on YouTube as Michaela Pink and later as Summer Black, she must like some kind of color theme for her name, pleaded guilty to aggregate theft after swindling eight individuals out of a total of $136,000 over nearly five years. Fox used her online platform platform to build trust with her followers before exploiting them in bogus real estate deals. People from Texas, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and California fell victim to her scam, with some even being parents of children who played baseball with her kids. The influencer, who presented herself as a lifestyle and dating consultant, attracted victims through her dating advice videos. Fox had convinced people to invest $35,000, supposedly to help her purchase a house for flipping. She promised quick property sales and assured the investors they would get a return of their principal investment along with a share of the profits. One victim, who chose to remain anonymous, said that he decided to invest due to a mutual friend who was supposedly already receiving returns on their investment. But as time passed, the investors started to get suspicious when Fox failed to provide updates. When they asked about their money or the returns, she dodged the questions with excuses. The Harris County District Attorney's Office, upon investigating the case, discovered that Fox had spent the money on everyday expenses, such as rent, childcare, school expenses, and personal items, leaving her victims without recourse for reimbursement. Sheila Hansel, the assistant district attorney in the Consumer Fraud Division, talked about the elaborate persona Fox had crafted online, describing her as very charming and showing how easy it was for her to run her scam. Catherine O'Connor, a forensic investigator, also detailed the range of expenditures that depleted the scammed funds. As Mickey Lynn Fox began her five-year prison sentence, her victims were left with a mix of emotions. On one hand, they're glad justice was served, but on the other hand, they're still out the money she stole. It's dirty that she was scamming people she knew that were friends with her kids, but it does make it a little better that she was using the money mainly to pay bills. Like, it's terrible what she did, but at least she wasn't out just dumping money on Birkin bags or something. And since she's in prison, maybe she'll change her name to Mickey Orange. Number four, the Special Forces Officer. 
Former British Special Forces serviceman David Apps left his elderly mother, Ann Bates, in financial ruin after a drunken gambling spree that drained nearly 12,000 pounds from her funds. Apps went on a 24-hour betting binge using his mother's credit card on Spreadex, a UK-based sports betting site. The incident unfolded during Apps's one-day stay at his mother's house. Under the influence of alcohol, he registered his mother's card on the betting platform, making 31 transactions totally 11,900 pounds. The consequences of Apps's actions were severe, forcing his elderly mother to sell her home and relocate to Australia to live with her daughter. Apps, currently serving as a director of special projects at the United Arab Emirates government, faced sentencing where the judge expressed bewilderment over Apps's decision to steal from his mother given his income. Apps, acknowledging the impact of drinking on his actions, pleaded guilty to fraud by representation. His mother, distressed by the revelation of the gambling spree, sold her apartment and moved, citing financial vulnerability and an inability to cover her bills. During the court proceedings, Ann Bates said that she still loves her son, but was devastated by his actions, saying that she never gave him permission to take the money. She also talked about her financial struggles, saying that it made her unable to pay her bills and forced her to put her apartment up for sale and move to Australia. Apps's lawyer blamed the maxing out of his mother's credit cards on a gambling addiction. She pointed to Apps's genuine remorse and willingness to provide for his mother while acknowledging the burden he dumped on her. The judge deferred the final sentencing, but forced Apps to pay $1,500 per month directly to Ann Bates and also wanted him to prove repayment of the defrauded sums. Additionally, Apps was instructed to pay a significant amount to compensate for the psychological trauma inflicted upon his mother and to provide evidence of continued counseling. And he also was sent to bed with no dessert. You only get dessert when you don't steal from your mum, David. Number three, the priest. Father George Athanasu, an assistant priest at All Saints Greek Orthodox Church in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, was at the center of a scandal involving the theft of over $117,000 in parish funds. The priest was hit with 223 felony charges, including theft by unlawful taking, forgery, bad checks, and access device usage. We don't know what access device usage is, but Athanasu did it, and he is in trouble for it. Athanasu's criminal activities went Went on for almost a year, with the priest accused of embezzling funds from the church's bank account. The whole thing came to light when the church leadership discovered missing checks that had been deposited into an unauthorized PNC bank account. The investigation pointed directly at Athanasu, who was the only person with a PNC ATM card during the time in question. Apparently, Father Dowling was on the case. Extra credit for all five of you who got that reference. Athanasu confessed to stealing the money due to personal hardships, and he acknowledged the criminal nature of his actions, saying it was a blatant disregard of the trust placed in him as a church member. The consequences were swift for Athanasu, who was immediately suspended without pay pending further investigation. Wait, priests get paid? We always thought they just kind of lived at the church or something. Well, anyway, the Greek Orthodox metropolis of Pittsburgh, in a letter to the church, expressed deep distress over the situation, urging prayers for all that were affected. Apparently, Athanasu had a gambling addiction, and that was a contributing factor to the embezzlement. Athanasu's attorney, attorney, Patrick Thomasy, acknowledged his client's gambling problem noting that it was referenced in the statement given to the police. While details about where the priest was gambling or the nature of his betting isn't known, Thomasy said that Athanasu planned to repay the church. The attorney said that a significant amount of money was already set aside for restitution and that the priest was committed to repaying every cent. The scandal hasn't only tarnished Athanasu's reputation, but has also triggered legal actions. The Pennsylvania Attorney General's office has taken over the criminal case due to a potential conflict of interest in involving lawyers at the Washington County District Attorney's Office who are members of the All Saints Church. Doesn't he kind of look like Nathan from South Park? Number two, the minister. Reverend Ivan Warwick played a pivotal role in scamming three elderly brothers out of 1.1 million pounds. Warwick, along with an accomplice, befriended the vulnerable siblings before conning them in a scheme that resulted in the loss of their family farm and savings. The McCullough brothers, Hugh, Roddy, and David, fell victim to Warwick and his partner Douglas Stewart, who manipulated them into granting power of attorney back in 2013. Exploiting the brothers' trust, the fraudsters convinced 
convince them to sign away their home and land for free. Unsurprisingly, the siblings, aged 84, 82, and 79 at the time, were all suffering from dementia. Despite the brothers seeking justice by reporting the incident to the police, law enforcement deemed it a civil matter, concluding that no crime had occurred. Warwick and Stewart then proceeded to evict the brothers from their farm and then sold the property. Because why wouldn't they do something like that? A civil court case initiated by the middle brother Roddy led to a judgment in October 2022. The ruling said that the brothers didn't comprehend the document relinquishing their farm and accused Warwick and Stewart of taking advantage of them through fraud or circumvention. So Warwick and Stewart were ordered to repay the ill-gotten gains, with Warwick owing 66,000 pounds and Stewart facing a larger sum of £691,000. Warwick, however, offered a small monthly repayment of £50, sparking outrage from the victim's cousin, Hugh Fraser, who called the proposal ludicrous, and since it would take a century to repay the full amount. As the legal proceedings unfold, Stewart was headed for a bankruptcy hearing as of the release of this video. Meanwhile, Warwick, who once preached to Prince Charles, faces internal disciplinary proceedings within the Church of Scotland. The sad thing is that these guys clearly clearly needed help, and if no family was immediately available, you'd think that their reverend of all people would be trustworthy. And the cojones on Warwick to basically offer to repay nothing. You can't help but think he was hoping to wait out some lifespans, which is shameful. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release to find out how these girls smuggled out stolen watches. Number 1. The Husband Stuart Williamson orchestrated an elaborate scheme to convince the family of his late partner, Diane Douglas, that she was alive for three years following her untimely passing at his hands. The disturbing situation blew up when family members grew suspicious and contacted the police, triggering a missing person investigation. Williamson, who portrayed himself as happily retired on social media, posted pictures of himself enjoying life playing cricket and vacationing in tropical paradises. Unbeknownst to Douglas's family, this facade concealed a gruesome reality. In December of 2018, Williamson tragically ended Douglas's life, later burying her in their garden. The extent of the deception only became clear when the family discovered that Williamson hadn't only concealed Douglas's passing, but had also been siphoning her pension and disability benefits for three years. During this time, he manipulated her family members into believing believing that Douglas was alive by sending text messages from her mobile phone and arranging meetings and events only to cancel them at the last minute. Williamson's actions went beyond financial exploitation. He played the role of a caring partner on the surface, while in reality, he used and exploited Douglas, who was diagnosed with Huntington's disease in 2007. Despite the relationship breaking down and a split in 2011, Douglas, facing significant mental impairment by 2016, found herself living with Williamson again. More disturbing details details emerged when it was revealed that Williamson, a former NHS manager, was described by colleagues as a sociopath and a narcissistic demeanor in a history of predatory behavior towards women. Colleagues shared memories of times where he displayed contempt for patients, showing a total lack of compassion. Williamson's manipulation extended to covering up the brutal passing. He admitted to police that he must have picked up a log, but conveniently claimed to have no memory of the incident. He directed authorities to Douglas's body buried in the garden of their rented farmhouse. The extent of Williamson's financial exploitation also came to light when family members provided statements talking about the deception that allowed him to continue abusing Douglas's finances for three years. The whole thing is a tragic tale about a guy who continued his life for years, leaving a grieving family to grapple with the unsettling truth. And despite the uncovering of his crimes, justice was never served, as Williamson evaded trial by taking his own life while on bail. What are some of the most daring robberies? Let's get right to it and start with number five. Watch this. Two Las Vegas women, Nikki Grandel and Stacy Johnson, targeted and robbed a man they met on the Caesars Palace Casino floor. Grandel and Johnson were socializing with their victim when they convinced him to take them to his hotel room at Caesars Palace. But it wasn't long after they entered the room before he realized he was missing $6,500 and a Rolex watch. The man kept his valuable belongings in a small bag, and after discovering it was empty, he confronted the women. 
Grandel and Johnson did what anyone would do when wrongfully accused, fled the room and ran into the stairwell. But the women couldn't move faster than the Las Vegas police. The victim immediately reported the theft, and officers tracked down Grandel and Johnson using the hotel's surveillance footage and the victim's description. Police arrested the pair moments later and charged them with grand larceny. Authorities had to conduct an extensive search to find the Rolex, resorting to an x-ray examination where they discovered Grandel had placed a luxury watch inside her body to conceal it. And by body, you probably know what we mean. The one only women have. Additionally, Johnson stuffed the cash inside her pants. Grandel and Johnson's actions might seem extreme, but they were far from the only people to conduct this type of criminal operation at a casino. Cassidy Rain Paris was at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, when she approached a man at the casino's elevators. After telling the man he seemed tired and stressed, she offered to go up to his room to give him a massage. The man accepted the offer, and the pair went to his room. During the massage, Paris ordered him to remove his clothing and kissed him. She suddenly developed chest pain and excused herself to go to the bathroom. Within minutes, the victim heard his room door close and discovered his belongings were missing. Paris stole a Patek Philippe watch worth $50,000, 10,000 bucks in cash, and $6,100 in poker chips. Paris's scheme was well thought out. After luring the man to his room, she used a diversionary tactic to distract him so she could rob him. Except she underestimated how easy it would be to track her down. Similarly to Grandel and Johnson, surveillance video captured Paris sprinting down the hall and driving away in a red car. Police located the GPS tracker on the red car she used to flee the scene. They apprehended Paris four miles east of the casino at a Days Inn motel and charged her with a second degree felony for theft. So wait, we can't just trust any random women we meet named Nikki, Stacy, or Cassidy? Number four, Gourley's Five. A gang of five robbers carried out a jewelry heist at Danielle Jewelers in Birmingham, England. The gang stole a highways maintenance truck and smashed it into the storefront, narrowly missing a staff member. Three of the four robbers pulled a smash and grab. They barged into the store and smashed glass display cabinets with sledgehammers, then grabbed the jewelry and stuffed it into their sports bags. The fourth gang member stayed in one of the group's three vehicles, but the fifth kept the crowd at bay, waving an axe. The gang used a black Land Rover Discovery, a white Toyota Hilux, and a black Toyota Corolla for the raid. They parked the Land Rover and Toyota Corolla to block both sides of the ride of the jewelers and reversed the Hilux into the store. The five men fled the scene in the Land Rover and Hilux, abandoning the Corolla at the scene. Surveillance footage caught the group leaving the vehicles nearby and climbing into a stolen Audi TTS and a BMW 420. Despite spending weeks planning their operation, security cameras captured the entire robbery and many concerned onlookers watched it occur. Her. The ringleader, John Gourley, attempted to sell a stolen bangle for $1,850 at Birmingham's Jewelry Quarter two hours after the raid, three miles from the jewelry store. Unfortunately for him, surveillance footage captured the entire interaction. Detectives used surveillance footage from nearby businesses and a witness's cell phone footage. They linked Gourley to the robbery by his fingerprints on the store's sale sheet. Another member, Hassan Zulikar, bought tape and pads at a nearby auto parts store, which she used to put false number plates on their getaway cars. Authorities discovered he stole the Land Rover after they recovered backings to the pads that Zulikar left inside the vehicle, which were covered in his fingerprints. Additionally, they tied the rest of the group to the theft through fingerprints, clothing, and tags from the stolen jewelry they found in one of the members' homes. Officers arrested all five members of the group and charged them with conspiracy to rob and possess an offensive firearm. Birmingham Crown Court conducted a four-week trial and found the group guilty. Their sentences range from 16 years to 12, reaching a combined total of 72 years. See, this is what happens when you get pulled in for one last big score. It never works. Number three, King Crab. 
David Sabil is accused of conning seafood distributors out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Allegedly, Sabil pretended to work at a grocery store and created fake email accounts to make it seem like they belonged to multiple Safeway grocery store employees. He used the accounts to deceive Arctic Foods, a San Francisco seafood distributor, out of $700,000. Sabil used a false name and fake trucking company to plan two pickups and had rental documents that tied him to the trucks. After collecting the second shipment of crab, the owner of Arctic Foods reached out to Sabil to discuss being overcharged. When the owner couldn't reach Sabil, they contacted Safeway, who revealed Sabil was not employed by them. The distributor owner informed authorities of Sabil's actions, who began to watch him. Sabil planned another shipment, but employees loaded cheaper seafood rather than king or snow crab into the truck. Police pulled over the truck driver and arrested him on counts of forgery and possession of a fraudulent bill. They found crab from Arctic Foods that matched one of Sabil's alleged shipments being sold below market value in Florida. When Sabil coordinated a fourth shipment from Arctic Foods, authorities placed position tracking devices on the packaging. The shellfish ended up at a junk removal service in Florida, with Sabil likely unloading the product when he realized it wasn't King Crab. Sabil booked a one-way ticket to Columbia, but Miami police arrested him before he could board the plane. Sabil faces charges of bank fraud, grand theft, and counts of forgery and possession of a fraudulent bill. But this wasn't the first time Sabil committed criminal activity in the seafood industry. Sabil posed as a seafood buyer in Florida and Alabama, where he would contact suppliers and claim he was buying large quantities of shrimp, fish, and lobster for a cruise line. Sabil arranged to receive the seafood at cold storage facilities in Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and Volusia counties, where he paid for the shipments with counterfeit checks. He also didn't pay a line of credit extended to him on at least one occasion. Law enforcement caught Sabil attempting to buy $60,000 of shrimp from a seafood wholesaler. He was allegedly responsible for two $200,000 in losses to seafood businesses in Florida and Alabama, and for this scheme, charged with bank fraud and grand theft. Number two, Romanian skimming. The Riviera Maya gang specialized in skimming ATMs and stealing from tourists in Playa del Carmen and other nearby tourist areas in Mexico. The gang used skimming devices to obtain their victims' credit card information and copied their details onto blank cards to withdraw cash from ATMs worldwide. They likely began operating in 2012 and have targeted thousands of tourists. Florian Tudor is the leader of the Riviera Maya gang, which has around 1,000 members. He's a business businessman from Craiova, Romania, known as El Tiburon or the shark, among other gang members. Romanian authorities believe Tudor ordered fellow gang members to threaten, blackmail, beat up, and even bump off the gang's enemies, including former members who fell out with them. ATM skimming involves stealing credit card information by placing a skimming device on the machine that reads the card's magnetic stripe when inserted. Criminals use the information to create cloned credit and debit cards, which they then use to withdraw money and make purchases. The Riviera Mayan gang took ATM skimming up a level, buying ATMs from well-known manufacturers, hacking their processors, and installing custom-designed software to steal bank card data. Their operation was far more sophisticated than the average criminals. They waited months before withdrawing money from compromised cards and almost always used them in ATMs far from where they were stolen or where the victims lived. The gang skimmers and poles operated worldwide, from India to Barbados to South Korea to Brazil and everywhere in between, making it almost impossible for victims victims to connect the theft their Mexican vacation. Tudor and his stepbrother, Adrian Anicescu, set up Top Life Servicio Company in Cancun. It gave the gang the appearance of legitimacy while covering their criminal activities. Quickly, the gang decided it would skim more effectively if it had its own ATMs. So they went out and purchased some forum well-known manufacturers like Triton and Hyosung. They hacked their ATMs processors and installed custom-designed software to capture card data. Additionally, the gang had an agreement with Multiva, a Expected Mexican bank to brand their ATMs with the bank's logo. Top Life operated over 100 Maltiva branded ATMs across the Riviera Maya and other popular tourist locations in Mexico by 2017. Wealthy tourists use those machines daily, innocently sticking their credit or debit cards for their information to be stolen. Each machine copied roughly 1,000 cards monthly from which the gang would withdraw $200. Combining all the machines they operated, the gang's monthly income was $20 million. Top Top Life invested the money
money in Mexican real estate, such as the construction of their headquarters, a multi-story villa with a rooftop swimming pool, and an elevator built on land in the prime area of Cancun. Under Tudor's leadership, the gang laundered the funds. Most of Tudor's aides were Romanian and would withdraw small sums from stolen cards in Mexico, then send the money to Romania in cash or through Western Union. Tudor's relatives and business partners would invest the profits in luxury real estate that they legally sold to cover up any criminal activity. Despite running a sophisticated and carefully planned operation, journalist Brian Krebs received a tip from a technician that worked for a Mexican ATM company that a gang was offering $6,000 to install Bluetooth skimming devices in ATMs. Krebs traveled to Mexico to further investigate the potential criminal activity and discovered many ATMs had a Bluetooth link called Free to Move. His trip prompted Krebs to write a three-part story on his blog about ATM skimming where he mentioned an Eastern European gang was behind the scam. Tudor was furious and ordered members to temporarily extract chips from 10 ATMs they owned and 25 to 30 ATMs belonging to other companies or banks. Mexican police never followed up on the revelation in Krebs' articles, but the gang temporarily shut down their operations anyway. Although the gang avoided criminal charges, Tudor was beginning to unravel. His relationship with one of his most trusted men, Constantine Soronel Marcu, deteriorated. Tudor was envious of Marcu's relationships with women, and Marcu wanted a higher cut than he was getting from the business. After a heated exchange over WhatsApp in May 2015, Tudor instructed all gang members to cut ties with Marcu. In April 2018, three gang members attacked Marcu. Two months later, Marcu passed away. Not only did his passing unleash a war with Marcu's family and allies, but it put the Riviera Maya gang on law enforcement's radar. In May 2021, Mexican authorities arrested Tudor following years of investigations by Mexican and Romanian authorities. His arrest was in response to an extradition request from Romania, where he could face charges of organized crime, extortion, and attempted murder. Number 1. Partners in Crime Husband and wife duo Emmanuel and Kara Williams committed bank robberies in Florida and Alabama between December 2012 and November 2013. The couple made little effort to cover their tracks, using similar methods in each robbery. Emmanuel would enter the bank wearing an afro wig or a hat and pass a note with block lettering to the bank teller, demanding money. The pair robbed 15 banks within a short time, with seven of those robberies occurring between December 2012 and February 2013. Six more robberies happened between August and October 2013, and at least two being only a few days apart. The amount they took ranged from $1,623 to $8,438 per bank, and their net total was $54,750. Onlookers and surveillance cameras caught the couple driving away in high-end sports utility vehicles. In an August 28th robbery, a nearby business's security camera captured Emmanuel getting into a black 2011 Mercedes-Benz GLK350. Another camera filmed them using a white Mustang in an August 22nd robber. Using flashy cars and crimes? Wonder if that'll blow back on them. The FBI linked both vehicles to Kara Williams after requesting video from the Florida Department of Transportation Turnpike Authority to track the license plate number of the Mercedes to her. FBI agents conducted physical surveillance of the couple's Tampa apartment where they had a front row seat into the duo's operation. There was a breakthrough in the case after the couple targeted a mid-Florida credit union, after which FBI agents tracked Emmanuel's cell phone activity to link his location to cell towers during the dates and times of the couple's crimes. They also used his social media photos to identify a scar on Emmanuel's left thumb, which he covered with a cloth on his hand to hide from the cameras in bank surveillance videos. Ten days after their first bank robbery, Kara gave birth around December 15, 2012. At the time, Kara was on maternity leave from her job at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Kara also took sick days corresponding to bank robberies in Tampa and Auburndale. The FBI's investigation into the couple uncovered the couple's criminal activities, resulting in the pair's arrest. Kara and Emmanuel were charged with conspiracy to obstruct, delay, or affect commerce by robbery, each carrying a potential maximum 20-year prison sentence. Jeez, Kara, if you hated your job so much, you could have just quit. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you would rather have. Never have to exercise again and have your perfect body, or never have to pay for food again.